Hear me well. So, hello everybody, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about debugging Scala code and especially using Lambda, but I don't want to like uh, give you information how to do it. I just want to give you information how it can be implemented and why it's so hard, why it's not trivial. It's also not like fully detailed information about how expression evaluator, because it will be the topic, works. Uh, but it's some like few ideas I want to show you. Okay, so what's the plan? So first, uh, I want to show you why we need lambdas in the first place, in the debugging. So why we need them, why we like, put some effort to support them in tooling. The second thing is uh, why are lambdas not so trivial? So why we have to spend like some really long time thinking, implementing and so on to, to get them working. And uh, at the end, I want to show how the Scala ID expression evaluator and the debugger face that problem I will mention in the second point. Okay, so uh, as, I thought, uh, as, as I said, it's not, uh, I don't want to introduce expression evaluator from Scala ID. Ask these guys and me, like tweet us, write mail us or something, but then we might create a presentation about this, but it's not, not today. Okay, uh, one like or thing if if you want to like know deeper the code I'm presenting, it's usually the cut part of the uh, Scala IDE itself. Uh, all the uh, I mentioned like the file name, and you can find it easily on the GitHub. Okay, so who had ever debugged Scala code? Just please. Okay. Uh, who want to use Lambda to debug Scala code at, like, at any point? Okay, so like three people. <laughs> okay, so now I have to convince you why we should use Lambda. Okay, so everywhere in Scala there is a lot of collections. And when we're debugging, I'm like stopping at some breakpoint and there is collection, big collection, big list of, I don't know, department, employees, anything. Okay. What I can do right now, I can go through each one and see if something wrong with them because something failing at some point. Can tool do it for me? If I don't have lambdas, it's really hard. I do it like a lot of times uh, and usually I end up like checking one by one if something is wrong or not. But having lambda, I can for example group things by location and see if some location is is empty or like it's only thing from the one location, but should be from multiple. I can partition employees and see which one, which group is okay, which not. I can like filter map and many, many, I can like uh, from list of big thing, I can gather only the information I need. It's multiple, multiple things I, I, I can, it can be, uh, I can use Lambda for. Callbacks, how we can evaluate some kind of code that using callbox techniques in Scala. It's common. It's, I, 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 we can see callbox almost everywhere in like more sophisticated li libraries. So without lambdas, it's impossible to use this as uh, expression or as conditional, conditional breakpoints. So it's another place where, where lambda are needed. Uh, so if we combine this collection and uh, Callbox in, in, into the conditional breakpoints, now we get a really uh, powerful tool for debugging. Uh, because there is a list and I can stop only when some condition uh, uh, is present. I don't have to uh, check each time the list. I hope I just show you a little bit that Lambda can be useful, that, uh, that can improve our debugging uh, experience. So the second part, why is it's not so trivial to support lambdas? Why are, why, why are lambdas so special? Because it's from point of view from Scala developer, it's, it looks like normal piece of code. There is like no special implicit something. Why it's so hard to support lambdas? The first thing, there is when we're debugging, there is two JVMs running. The one that's debugged where our application lives. And the second one is debugging JVM. It's maybe not good correctly grammatically, but it's short names. Don't, don't blame me for this. Uh, 
and the problem is, uh, and uh, it is connected using JDI and other uh, JVM uh, protocols to communicate between these two uh, machines, uh, the virtual machines. So what's the problem? The problem that when I create a Lambda, I created the Lambda in the uh, debugging JVM, but Lambda should be called in the debugged one. So somehow this Lambda should appear in the debugged uh, machine because it's not present at the start of that machine because it's some new code. So what I need is the, is the first problem is JDI-based class loading. I will we'll come back to this later on. If you have like any question at any time, just ask. Don't wait for the end, okay? The second thing, uh, okay, we can ask, uh, there's like methods, there is values of the objects and so on, but there's also two things that can, cannot be accessed uh, using, during the compilation. So it's uh, method parameters and it's local variables. It's all, both of them lives in the uh, stack, so it's not present in like in memory. So, and our lambdas that I want to, like, for example, use it in, um, in my Lambda, so I have to somehow uh, access that values in my, in my Lambdas. But it's, again, the two words, because all, both these variables and uh, method parameters can be accessed using JDI, can, can be accessed on debugging JVM, but not on the debugged one. So there is a second problem. Uh, access runtime values, so method parameters and local variables. And functions, lambdas are functions, uh, are generic uh, types. So in runtime, every function has the same type. It's function one, function two, function three. There is no in, from int to int or from string to map of int and double. I have only information about this uh, function one, function two. Uh, it's also applied to all the generics, and Lambda is usually, uh, it's always, basically all, always lives with generics, and generics are not present in the uh, runtime. And okay, we can use, for example, presentation compiler, but have you ever used Eclipse? Can you rally on anything in Eclipse? It's like <laughs> UDP, it's sometimes some, something crash, and there is, Okay, presentation compiler. Uh, we have normal compiler that puts bytecode, and presentation compiler is a compiler that show you that cor code is correct, this is not correct when you're typing. We have before you compile, it's the things that mark your class as red, but it ha it can also do many things like you know the types and so on. So we can use presentation compiler to provide generic types, but we don't always have the this luxury to have presentation compiler working. For example, our pro project does not compile because it compiles only on, I don't know, Gradle, and we don't have tool to import our project to Eclipse. I faced this problem many times. Okay, uh, so we can, for example, let's skip the generics. We can use any to nothing. Function are conv convariant, so from the argument point of view and so on, so why we, why we can use this, so like just mark all the lambdas that takes like any or any any and not uh, and produce nothing. Okay, it's some approach, but it is all, it will your always work. No, for example, there is a uh, functions like filter. It's really common. We use filter everywhere, but it does not compile when we pass the function that takes any and produce nothing. It requires function that produce boolean. So when we're missing this full generic types, how can we use filter correctly? We compile our Lambda, not interpret it. So the third problem, it's uh, how we can type our Lambdas when we cannot rely on presentation compiler or we don't have in full information about generic types. It's not usually the, for the 95% of the cases, it's not a problem, but there's this 5% and Maybe I'm unlucky, but I usually swim in this 5% when presentation compiler is not working or uh, code does not compile or I don't have sources. I even debug code that I don't have like valid sources for that, that code. Our debugger might support this. Okay. So now we 
focus on each of these three problems. So let's take a look on the JDI based class loading. When we think like a minute about this, we have to do like three simple steps. So first we need to compile our lambda to byte array, basically to class file. Uh, then some, somehow we should send that bytecode to debug the machine using JDI and then define class in class loader on the debug side, on the debug JVM. Seems, uh, seems, seems trivial. Okay, let's see. So let's start with compilation. Our lambda look like this, usually. Or at least should look, because there is like, it, it shouldn't be too long, but it's not the topic of my talk. I, there is a great talk out from Jamie Allen about how lambda should look. I suggest you should watch it. Okay, so it's a piece of code, it's a function, but function is not a member of Java machine, it's not the first class member. So we should translate this uh, piece of code into class, so it could be compiled to class file. So let's take this simple lambda and wrap it, wrap, wrap it in the custom function, that extends function even. It's basically how our lambdas are implemented on the uh, on for, for the JVM by Scala compiler. Okay, seems trivial. Now we have to introduce the topic of class listener because we are using toolbox in Scala IDE to compile such lambdas, but toolbox does, doesn't produce byte arrays. It produces only the uh, function that returns the value from the co compiled expression, like object. But we need bytecode. So how we do it? We just com remember all directories packages from the toolbox output, compile our lambda, find a new generated directory because toolbox when it compiles some code, create random packages, pack package name, and store all the classes in there. Gather the class and find all classes that are marked with our marker, for example, called custom lambda. Now we've got this lambda and because lambda have another nested lambda inside. So we have to grab all, all, all of those classes and class load them on JDI. It's basically, it's, I don't want to go into this, it's basically how toolbox compilation output looks like. It's long and boring names. Okay, so we, now we read the file and got the array of bytes from the required class. Now we have to send this to the debug machine. JDI allow us to send data to the debug machine using two, 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 two techniques, using primitives and using string. It's not like we're sending data in the uh, namespace of uh, JDI, it's creating mirror of some type. So we can create mirror of primitive and mirror of string. IntelliJ has also support for uh, lambdas and he sent the, the byte classes set creating byte array and set each byte separately. When I see it, I, I, I'm thinking about this, I was thinking about this, but ah, it not sounds fun, it sounds boring and long, I don't like it. So there is, we can also create a, a mirror of any string. Okay, I can send just once all, all the class, but I have to translate my bytes to string, so for example, I, I pick base 46 and it works fine. There is a side note. If you ever try to build any tool that work over the JDI, there is one serious limitation. We cannot create, like for example, library. We can, but it's like expensive. Uh, and use it on the side of the debug machine. We can only rally on the uh, Java and Scala standard libraries. Because if we just, for example, create even small library that contain, containing not 20 classes, 20 class files, it can be one Scala file, uh, we should class load them, each, each, each one of that class on the debug machine. We can forget about some classes, some classes may be corrupt. So basically when you're creating tool for that using JDI, we should really limit it libraries that are used on the side of the debug JVM. That is why we are using base 46. That it's as part of standard Java library. Okay, so here is how like the meat of, of, of using JDI looks like. So basically, we take our code, translate it to string, create mirror of that string, loads 
the same data type converter on the side of the debug machine, find uh, reference to methods and call that method. Using JDI, like for involving methods, look pretty much as using reflection because it's, it's basically the same. Okay, so now we have this byte of array on the debugged JVM. Now we have to, now we just need to class load them and it's the same piece of code. So just grab a reference to class loader, class, grab reference to method and call that method define class that takes a byte array. And we got our class, class loaded. Okay, first thing solved. Seems easy, right? Okay, another aspect is accessing runtime values, method parameters and local values. So the, the things that comes to mind at first is closure, because it's a similar problem is when you create lambda we, and we access the uh, members of the, like for example, local, local variable or like member of that class, it's convex to closure. It's the same for nest, uh, nested class and so on. So this is how closure works. So if we're using, inside the lambda, if we're using uh, any local variables, it is passed our uh, constructor parameter for that, the class that represents that lambda. Now we have to implement uh, for the expression that we want to evaluate. There is one major problem. We have to find our closure parameters. And we can, cannot assume that all parameters are closure because user, for example, can make a mistake. So we have to find all the, the, the closure parameters and somehow decide if it's closure or this compilation error. And then we, there is the simpler part. We have to inject this value to create a lambda. So how we find our closure parameters? There is a, in, when we're working with the, because now we try, we start working with Scala AST because we pick, uh, we take the expression, parse it, and then we have the Scala AST and try to play with it. So when we are working with AST and especially all, all trees, the traverser comp the concept is the, the first tool we use. So what, what it does, it just traverses through all the tree nodes and we can decide if we want to take an action of different node. And this is a part of unbound um, value support that search for, for the value, for the closure parameter, basically. And there is like three steps, three, three basic things that we can do. So we can, for example, in the first case, for in the case of ident, it's in the identifier in Scala. So for example, if, if I call <coughs> just, I don't know, my list to string, list is the ident. Uh, if I see ident, I can decide if I want to register as an unbound or not. It's simple, I'm basically in the leaf of this ASD. There is the second thing, there is the typed. Typed means there is some value and there is a type. From the searching on closure parameters, type is not important. So I basically skip the type of the tree. So I can decide if I want to go further from some, some nodes or not. I just keep that type in here. And of course, in different case, I call super that takes all know how to traverse each, each, each kind of tree and do it for me. So how the variable proxy traverse is implemented? We split identifiers into two groups, bound and unbound in current scope. So when the value is bound, so where it's like, it's value, variable or dev definition. So somewhere up there is a definition for this. It's a name, named parameter, so I can name the value. It's also bound now. It's, it's inside the case, so it's also the pattern matching or it's for comprehension, or it's lambda implementation parameter because lambda takes parameter and also present in the body of the lambda. Okay, I forget about one thing, packages. In this, from the definition from above, mutable in here, it's unbound. This is not def. It's not named parameter, it's not pattern matching, uh, uh, part of pattern matching case, it's not lambda implementation parameter. So mutable is unbound. Okay, so now I've show you the, the one of the biggest problem when you play with AST. You always, you always forget about some kind of tree shape. 
okay, I implement all way of, I don't know, calling method, but I forgot that it can be multiple parameter method that, take, that, that takes type signature implicit and two of parameter lists are varags. Well, and it can be worse, it can be worse. So you always, you always forgot about some three shapes in like in general case. So th that is why it's so hard. We right now expression evaluator. I'm I'm sure there is multiple uh, expression that we don't even think that can be created because Scala is Scala or any programming language is real, real, really, really complex. But so another side now, just for ch changing topics. Why we don't care about packages because packages is don't support supported uh, in the first place in toolbox. Why? First place in toolbox, why? Because packages is not real concrete member in J JVM. It's more like phantom. It's, uh, I cannot enumerate all packages in during the runtime. I can enumerate classes, class loaded classes, but I cannot enumerate packages because there is no, no concrete, I like, don't know, no, nothing concrete about packages. Packages is only a path, only a yeah, it's, it's important on the compilation for the compilation time. In the runtime, it has no meaning. So that is why it's just, toolbox doesn't support packages. Like maybe not at all, but there is some cases that is not supported. This is one of uh, this one of them. This mutable. There is a Scala issue for this. Okay, so. We gather, like, come back to the top, let's come back to the, the, the first topic. We gather all the, the, the closure parameters, and now we have to inject into the newly created lambda. It's really simple. So we take this uh, expression and let's uh, transform it into something like this. So context is in expression evaluator word, it's like entry point to all our method. And we just create new instance of lambda and pass them all the closure parameters that we found. In Scala IST, it's looking like this. So basically, when you for the simple uh, operation, Scala IST is not so. There's there's nothing special. It's really simple when you look at this. But when you have to find a way how to implement this, now it's the step starts. But it's 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 not so hard. I just you can play with this easily, maybe not using toolbox, but macros are really fun. So we solved another problem, accessing a runtime value. Now, uh, maybe not problem, but our feature is so typing lambdas, but typing lambdas not like general, but typing lambdas when you don't have like full, full, full general information. So the problem, we have a list, and we will try to filter if the list is connected. If we know that uh, the list is the list of channel, it's simple. Because we know, we know that channel have a method connected, is connected, <coughs> and we know that it uh, returns boolean. But the problem starts when we don't know if the con is connected return booleans, and we want to have, and we want to, and we want to compile our expression. Uh, as I mentioned, if we rely on JD, only on JDI, we get, access to runtime information about types. So no, it's only a list. We don't know it's the list of sources, a list of string, or a list of anything. We know there's only a list. So right now, we don't have any, we, we cannot compile such thing. So what, what can we do? If we don't have types, like we can like create a st static typing library, maybe we should go to the dynamic way, okay. So the first idea, let's use Scala dynamic trait. Uh, in expression evaluator, the, the, like the working horse of all the expression is JDA proxy. It's basically, there is two uh, phases of the expression evaluation. The first is type, is type check, when the expression is, comp is type checked, so it's normal Scala code, and then it's translated to this proxy word, and now we use dynamic because Scala compiler expands all, all, all the, this reflection like calls for us. So basically how dyna dynamic work. I don't know if someone, someone of you use dynamic trait. Okay, one person. Okay, so 
dynamic works like this. If Scala compiler cannot find any method matching the definition and dynamic trait is mixed, he use apply dynamic or select dynamic and passing the name and the argument. It's basically all. It's nothing. It's just simple code transformation. But you can use it here. So what we are created here is JDA proxy that have dynamic methods that return JDA proxy. So basically, we're just creating Groovy or any dynamic language here. Does it solve our problem? Not completely. Because filter still cannot compile. Because we have, right now, we have Lambda that takes JDA proxy and returns JDA proxy. And we still need JDA proxy that returns Boolean. It still does not compile. Okay, so is the idea like word doesn't work anything? No. Uh, because there is a lot of use cases, a lot of places that is enough. So for example, when we mapping, when we grouping by and so on, when we start, when we enter the JDI word, JDI proxy word, we can live with this. Because, okay, it's failing the runtime, but usually it will work and show us what, what we need. Can we, so can we like somehow support filter when we don't have generic types? Okay, so if dynamic don't, don't work, let's create code that, that cannot compile for the first look. So right now, what we have here, it's a list of JDA proxy, but we're passing them to filter method that take, that, that take channel, but channel is implicitly typed. How we, can, how we compile this? Uh, this th we call this type lambdas, and we have like special treatment for this in, in expression evaluator. So we're changing our AST, our expression, before we compile it. So what's the plan? The first thing, Type a, lamb type a lambda parameters. So closures and parameters that lambda takes, then using that information, compile our lambda, and use that type uh, to the compile of all the, all the expression. So basically, right here, we know that x, the x is channel, and we know that it's connected between Boolean, so that in, in this place we know that Okay, we can create lambda that takes any and re returning boolean. So the code will compile. Okay, simple to set how we how to implement this. Uh, how, let's come back to plan. So first thing, type our lambda parameter is the hardest part. So it's under plan. Sorry, I'm creating too much plan, but it's it's easier to understand for me at least. So what, <laughs> what I will do. So let's take the code that's preceding our lambda. So there will be a value definition, methods, import, and so on. Let's take all these closure parameters. We know the names because we have the traverser that I, I mentioned before. But we don't know types. So let's put this, all these mentioned uh, closure parameters in some kind of placeholder function and type check it. And then we can gather types, probably. So our expression is temporarily transformed to something like this in our case. So there is a like definition of list of source, and there is the placeholder function that takes only source. And let's type check it. It's placeholder function takes uh, variarchs of any, so it will compile. So uh, how to? Okay, so we compile this and now traversing the generated AST. So again, we use simple traverser and when we see the placeholder args that I will show you later how to extract typed argument, arguments and okay, it's, it's all, all, all we need, not more. Seems trivial and how to extract that placeholder argument, ar ar arguments and translate it into the map. It's also simple, so when we see the, our placeholder method, for each argument, find the type and map it to the name. And we have types. So then we have types. So we compile lambda. We got the return, returning type, the type of the, the retur type that lambda returns and then we can put it into some other placeholder that we compile with the whole expression. 
And now finally our filter works. Okay, we can mark it as solved, but it's a hack. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it can't be doing the other way. Okay, so now all I hope seems a little bit trivial, like this river. But when you go deeper and deeper and you see the problems, it starts looking like this. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of crocodiles. It's no stone, it's only the crocodiles. So when you start to implement one thing in the expression evaluator, there is another, and there are two things combined, and you have to strike edge case. Another, 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 another. So our expression is like really big, and at some point we start implementing another compiler for, for Scala. It is worth, even if it does not work as we want. Yeah, yes, because we learn so much about the Scala details. We out, now we can look differently at Scala code because we know what is done. What, what, what is that? What, what, what is done here? And yeah, we even like have multiple. Okay, we implemented, and there is okay. Why we do it at? place like this, why not create an, like lambda or something? Uh-huh, and brainstorm, and later on we find like mul mul multiple reasons why not, why, why so and so on. So, my general advice for you, contribute for your and greater good. Just find some open source that you like, that is like well maintained, and try to contribute, because you get great feedback, because there, there are really smart guys there and they show you it's bad code, you should rewrite it. So you learn a lot. Okay, any questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you.